Okay, hi everybody. I'm going to talk to you guys today about Stephen King's It. And I'm going to focus on the first three paragraphs just to kind of give you a taste of his style. We're talking about scary stories, and I figure what better way to talk about a scary story than to uh, talk about the master himself. So uh, I've, if you forgive me for looking over to the side a little bit, um, I do have the three paragraphs up on my other monitor, uh, just so that I'm not straight reading off this screen. Um, okay, but here is the three. Here are the three paragraphs. Now you have a sheet on Schoology that uh, enables you to make some notes in between each paragraph, and so I'm hoping that uh, as we go through this, that you're going to be jotting down some notes. That's my expectation for you. Okay, so let me read this real quick. The terror which would not end for another 28 years, if it ever did end, began so far as I know or can tell with a boat made from a sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain. The boat bobbed, listed, righted itself again, dived bravely through treacherous whirlpools, and continued on its way down Wickham Street, Witcham Street toward the traffic light, which marked the intersection of Witcham and Jackson. The three vertical lenses on all sides of the traffic light were dark this afternoon in the fall of 1957, and the houses were all dark too. There had been steady rain for a week now, and two days ago the winds had come as well. Most sections of Derry had lost their power then, and it was not back on yet. A small boy in a yellow slicker and red galoshes ran cheerfully along beside the newspaper boat. The rain had not stopped, but it was finally slackening. It tapped on the yellow hood of the boy's slicker, sounding to his ears like rain on a shed roof, a comfortable, almost cozy sound. The boy in the yellow slicker was George Denborough. He was six. His brother, William, known to most of the kids at Derry Elementary School, and even to the teachers, who would never have used the nickname to his face, as Stuttering Bill, was at home hacking out the last of a nasty case of influenza. In that autumn of 1957, eight months before the real horrors began, and 28 years before the final showdown, Stuttering Bill was 10 years old. And so right off the bat, if we just look at the first paragraph, you'll notice that one of the things the first paragraph does is it establishes a tone. And it establishes a tone by giving us some foreshadowing. There is something that it calls um, the terror. In fact, the first two words of the entire story are the terror. The terror which would not end for another 28 years. So right off the bat, we're told that this is something that is happening right now. It's terrible, it's terrifying, and it's going to last for a long, long time. It even says, if it ever did end, which is pretty ominous. So right off the bat, Stephen King fills us with dread, with a tone of terror. Paragraph two uh, is much more detailed. But notice the change in paragraph two. In paragraph two, we're not talking about the terror. We're now talking about a boat, a newspaper boat, floating and bobbing uh, down, uh, down the street. There's a little boy uh, who we don't know yet um, who is playing with this little toy or this little newspaper boat. We know the year. We know the town, Derry. It's 1957. We know the street corner. We know that there's a lot of rain. Okay? And so in the first paragraph, we have something called the terror, which is going to last for a long time. And then we're introduced to a little uh, very vulnerable boat. This boat is almost representative of the characters or the people of Derry. You know, it's bobbing, it's listing, it's riding itself up again. Maybe there's some hope there. It's diving bravely. So there's going to be some brave characters. This boat is like a representation of the characters in this story. 
but look at how vulnerable they are. It's just a newspaper boat. And it's bobbing and weaving through whirlpools and rain and all sorts of things. There's a power outage. There's lots of uh, unending rain almost. It's almost foreboding. You know, you have this, this sense that uh, whatever hope, whatever bravery is in the people of this town that's represented in this newspaper boat, that it's very fragile. So right off the bat, you contrast that with the terror, the introduction of the conflict, the terror at the beginning, and then the fragile nature of the main characters, and you're almost left wondering, do they even stand a chance against something so terrible that we don't even know about? I don't know. So then in the third paragraph, we have two boys. One who is apparently playing with the toy boat, the newspaper boat in the rain, wearing his yellow jacket. Uh, and then the other boy who's older, who's stuck at home with the flu. And we have, so we have George, we have Bill. And right off the bat, we're given character development about Bill. He's stuttering Bill. He has a uh, speech impediment. We know that they go to elementary school. We know how old they are. Um, notice the example of showing, not telling. I love the description here, talking about the rain. The rain had not stopped. Well, rain in most stories is seen as a negative. And certainly in the context of this story, it would be seen as a negative. The rain had not stopped. There's power outages and unstopping rain. It tapped on the yellow hood of the boy's slicker, his, his uh, wet jacket, sounding to his ears like, a rain, like rain on a shed roof. A comfortable, almost cozy sound, as if it's kind of lulling them into a false sense of safety in this town, right before the terror that we already know is right upon us because of paragraph one. These characters don't know it, but we do. Remember we talked about dramatic irony? That's dramatic irony. They have no idea what they're in store for, but we do, because it's something terrible. Notice that George is this carefree little boy, doesn't seem to know about um, the upcoming dread, and we don't really know much about him. But we do know about Bill, because look what it says here. Good writers make their main characters stand out in some way. He has a stutter, he has a speech impediment. This is something that is probably not valued in their world. Probably something that could cause him a great deal of bullying or uh, apprehension or dread and could add to the terror that they're about to face. And notice the last lines of this. He's hacking out the flu it says at the end, in that autumn of 1957, eight months before the real horrors began, and 28 years before the final showdown, Stuttering Bill was 10. So a 10-year-old boy is eight months away from facing real horror. And so that is something that um, builds this sense of tension. And so in your stories, I want you to practice this. I want you to practice a, a beginning to your story. Now, you don't have to stick with this. You don't have to completely rewrite your story, but practice with your own story. In your first paragraph, set up the danger. What is the danger that your main character or main characters is about to face? Make it vague. Tell us the nature of that danger, maybe, but don't tell us anything specific. Then, in the second paragraph, give us uh, some character development, some setting. Give us a sense of how the main characters, the main town, the main setting, is unaware of the danger that it's about to face. 
And then in the third paragraph, give us character development. What do we need to know about your main character or main characters that's going to help them through or maybe make it more difficult for them to go through the dangers that you've already set up in paragraph one? Give that a try. You might find that you 